different audience. You will easily understand if I begin my short address to you in my very imperfect English by addressing my warm thanks to the Mexican people and to the man who leads them with such merit and courage, praise and cardinals. When monstrous and absurd accusations were hurled at my and my family, when my wife and myself were under the lock and key of the Norwegian government, without being able to defend ourselves, the Mexican government opened the doors of his magnificent country and said to us, here you can freely defend your rights and your honor. Naturally, it is not a sympathy for myself, my ideas, which has motivated President Cardenas, but a fidelity to his own ideas. All the more meritorious, then, is his act of democratic hospitality, the rare his days. Stalin's trial against me is built upon false confessions, extorted by modern inquisitorial methods in the interest of the ruling elite. There are no crimes in history more terrible in intention and execution than the Moscow trials of Zinoviev Kamenev and the, of Petakov Radek. His trials developed not from communism, not from socialism, but from Stalinism, that is from the irresponsible despotism of the bureaucracy over the people. He was a little man, about five foot five, in his sixties, rather tubby, enjoyed his drinks and his smokes, an unlikely hero perhaps, but in the dark days of the 20th century, he helped lead the Russian people through a battle for their own survival. And he was one of the biggest mass murderers in history. In the period from 1936 to 1938 occurred one of the greatest political purges in Russian history, known as the Moscow Trials. In his video address in 1936, just four years before his own death, Trotsky had pointed the finger at Stalin as the sole organiser of a mass conspiracy to murder and destroy all of those who had opposed him. For decades since, most historians too have condemned Stalin as having manufactured the murder of his closest political rivals in order to extend his own power and secure his authority as the supreme leader of the Soviet people. Yet, how far has this view been correct? In 1967, the historian Isaac Deutscher wrote, Stalin's wider motive was to destroy the men who represented the potentiality of alternative government, perhaps not of one but of several alternative governments. It is in the whole preceding story, in the setting of the trials and their consequences, that the motivation for this is found. According to Deutscher, Stalin perceived potential threats not as dissatisfaction to policy, for opposition there was highly sparse and incapable of action, but rather as a question of timing. Only a sudden shot to the whole machine of power might have enabled an opposition to rally supporters. A danger of that kind was taking shape, and it threatened from abroad. The first of the great trials, that of Karmanov and Zinoviev, took place a few months after Hitler's army had marched into the Rhineland. The last of Bukharin and Rykov ended at the same time as the occupation of Austria. Deutsche thus inferred that, although Stalin took every precaution to avoid war with Hitler, he feared the expanding German imperialism. In the case of single-handed fight between Russia and Germany, the prospect seemed grim, but the danger of internal instability as a result was even more precarious. Deutsche added, The ghost of the last Tsar must have more than once appeared before Stalin as he viewed Hitler's preliminaries to war. In Stalin's mind in the crisis of war, the leaders of the opposition, had they survived, might have indeed been driven to action, if Stalin's conduct of war seemed incompetent. In 1941 and 1942, the Red Army witnessed terrible defeats. Hitler was at the gates of Moscow. Millions of Russian soldiers were in German captivity. A dangerous crisis in the morale of people had developed. Was this truly a possible foreign policy scenario Stalin feared? And what weight does its realisation actually hold on the formation of Moscow trials three years earlier? In truth, Deutsche was writing in a time period immediately after the Second World War, and, like most historians at the time, assumed the inevitability of historical progression. However, in 1936, neither Stalin nor anyone else could have predicted the start of another world war or how it could develop. 
a German foreign policy threat was not on the Russian agenda at the time, and this is easily affirmed from the trial records. Having lost their ideological stock in trade, and imbued with bitter hatred towards the socialist victories, the leaders of the Trotsky Zinoviewite bloc sank utterly into the swamp of Weidgardism. Seeing no favourable prospects for themselves, they have resorted to the gun. The accused were described as selfish, self-serving individuals. They were demonised as characters of pure evil, who only sought to gain power over the Soviet government from their own personal gain. They were convicted of white guardism, or what the Soviet mind believed to be a return of suppression and slavery. However, there is no mention of the threat of fascism, nor any evidence that presented to show the support and involvement of the German government. Whatever Trotsky, Zinoviev and Karmanev had planned, according to Vyzhinsky, they did so alone. It was not until 1938, just before the war, when the Nazi link was fully established in the trial records. However, it was never inferred that the German government was specifically plotting something vicious against the Soviet Union. In his opening speech, the state prosecutor stated, As regards those against whom charges are preferred in the present case, a considerable number of accused have, according to their own confessions, been spies, agents in foreign intelligence services. He then began to list the respective memberships accordingly. The accused Rosenholf started his spying activity for the German general staff in 1923 and for the British intelligence service in 1926. The accused Rakowski had been an agent of the British intelligence service and of the Japanese. The accused Chernoff started his spying activity for Germany in 1928. The early years of the 1920s, of which the accused had admitted to have been active spies in the multitude of foreign intelligence services listed, indicates it is more probable that the Soviet state was simply identifying its natural enemies as a means of propaganda, rather than making preparations for the German invasion. However, if Stalin was not preoccupied with foreign policy threats, then could there be another way to prove his leading role in the trials, or is this assumption altogether incorrect? According to another branch of historians, such as Robert Service and Robert Conquest, the clues lay hidden in Stalin's personality and character. According to Service, Stalin has a predisposition towards mass terror and did not need to be pushed by others. His chief consideration was security. He made no distinction between his personal security and the security of his policies. Stalin was shocked by the way General Franco had easily picked up followers in the Spanish Civil War of July 1936 and he intended to prevent this from happening in the USSR. His strategy? Eliminate all possible resistance to the Politburo and replace it with his own loyal staff. The key evidence for this thesis lies in the formation of the second and third trial. In 1936, Georgi Piatagov was arrested and pressured into confessing treasonous links with counter-revolutionary groups, implementing the rest of the surviving Politburo, namely Bukharin, Rykov and Tomsky. Although Stalin proceeded cunningly so as not to be suspected, in the June plenum of 1937 he was forced to take sides. This way we're killing off the entire party, objected Kaminsky, the Commissar of Health. And you don't happen to be friends with these enemies? Stalin barked back. They're absolutely not my friends, Kaminsky replied. Well, in that case, it means you're a berry from the same field as them, retorted Stalin. For service during the incident, Stalin finally had showed himself as the chief architect of these trials. However, how far can we really take for a verbal clash against all other evidence? The trial records certainly do not seem to support this theory. If Stalin had a master plan of who he wanted to eliminate, then the victim's list ought to have been quite consistent. Yet, the first time Bukharin, Rykov and Tomsky were implemented in terrorist activity in the trial of 1936 and the state prosecutor announced investigations, the matter was then dropped. It would take another two years and another trial before Stalin had the confidence to try again. Yet, there was no political reason in 1936 or 1937 as to why the final trial had to be delayed. Furthermore, the implication of Yagoda 
charged in 1938 with ordering medical assassinations and planning industrial sabotage, does not correlate with the pattern described by Service and Conquest. Jagada had previously been one of Stalin's most trusted and lethal officers. His downfall was sudden and did not precipitate an act of disloyalty. Did Stalin improvise in the grand schemes, or was there something else hiding in the dark?